This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt, felt right. Right. I was so And I just happy. thought, well, I figured it out. Wow. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. Quick reminder, we're running a survey of our listeners. If you haven't already, please fill it out. We also have shows coming up Wednesday, September 4th in New York, and Monday the 23rd in Boston. All of that is at storycollider.org. This week's story is from John Rennie. The story was recorded in May 2013 at the Bell House in Brooklyn as part of our three-year anniversary. Back when I was working at Harvard Medical School as a lab technician, pretty much by definition, everyone there was smarter than I was. Um, I mean, of course, because I was just, you know, some guy, it was the early 1980s, I was just some guy right out of college with my lousy bachelor's degree. I, I certainly really didn't even belong in the same thought with, with brilliant guys like Dan, the head of our lab, who, uh, who, was, who was just you know, a, a genius cell biologist. In addition to the fact that he was this warm, enthusiastic presence, I would, I would tell him about things I had done, and, and he would say, Dynamite, Johnny, that's great news. He was the only person who called me Johnny. I mean, uh, Dan, so he was, he was very, very smart, and he was also, you know, he was this, this warm mentor and friend to everybody who he knew. But it wasn't even just Dan. It was, it was everybody. It was, it was the grad students. It was the postdocs. They all knew so much more about science than I did. So you can imagine how dumbfounded I was the day that I walked into the lab and found Dan and his senior postdoc on their hands and knees scooping up mercury that had spilled onto the floor with their bare hands and dumping it down a sink. And I, I looked at this and I'm, you know, trying to say, that, don't do that. That's incredibly dangerous for you and for whatever's on the other end of that sink. And they were saying, oh, no, no. We, we always used to, to do this all the time when we were, we were kids. We would play with broken thermometers. And I would say, it's not a broken thermometer. That's several ounces of liquid mercury. I mean, it was like it was a broken container. It was, it was like, like a milk container of mercury spilled all over the floor. And they're scooping it up with their hands. So I made the point to them that this really was not a safe thing to do. And, and I don't know that they really believed me, but they, they took my word for it enough that they, they stopped dumping it down the sink. And they let me call the environmental health services there at the, at the medical school. And they came and vacuumed it up the way that it was supposed to be. There were a few more of these sorts of incidents. Like the, the day that I was uh, going into one of the, the old uh, chemical cabinets, and I came across this uh, jar of a, of a chemical uh, called picric acid, uh, trinitrofol. Uh, trinitrophenol. Now, um, the one fact that I actually remembered from my organic chemistry class was that uh, uh, picric acid is a close relative of TNT and is incredibly explosive. Now, not normally when it's in normal circumstances when it's, uh, you know, like in a solution of some kind, but if you let it dry out, it starts to become very, very dangerous. And uh, in fact, my, my professor had made this, he would always talk about how every once in a while there would be like high schools and things would come across some sort of you know, little jar of this stuff uh, that they would have to call the bomb squad to cart away because it had dried out and crystallized a little bit. And I'm standing here at Harvard Medical School looking at this one gallon drum that has crystals of picric acid hanging off the lid roughly an inch and a half thick. So I, I go to Dan and 
I explain the situation in some way by like pointing at the jar and going, explosive! <laughs> and, you know, Dan says, oh, Johnny, that jar's been in there for, for decades. Uh, I, I, I don't see any reason why that would be dangerous now. And I, I stammered out an answer like, chemistry! <laughs> and, you know, so again, they, they let me call the, the environmental office and I said, I've got a big jar of crystallized picric acid here. And they said, we'll be coming right over. <laughs> so it was after that that Dan decided to name me to be our lab's safety officer <laughs> because I was apparently the responsible guy. Now the joke of this is that at this point in my life, I sure didn't feel like the responsible guy. I mean, the whole reason that I was there working as a lab technician was that I had decided to postpone going off to graduate school because I nominally wanted to find out what the day-to-day -day working life of a scientist was like. But the reality, I know in retrospect, was that I was basically wrestling with the fact that I really wanted to work as a writer. And I was trying to rationalize how to do that. So I was spending all of my time doing the wrong work. So it was creating a real kind of cognitive dissonance that I had to deal with there. In addition, of course, as I said, I was in my 20s, so there was the inevitable romance that goes wrong, and that caused all kinds of, you know, Sturm and Drang, and it, it managed to, you know, to, to, to join up with my natural genetic tendencies toward moodiness and melodrama. And it, basically, at that point in my life, I was going through what, in retrospect, I think it's safe to say was a little tiny bit of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and uh, uh, that meant that I was mostly kind of responsible, and then every once in a while I would have these kind of little psychotic breaks and do something really irresponsible and reckless. Um, example being the the time I was out with some friends, we were driving around one weekend in a station wagon, and while we we're traveling, I just decided it would really be fun for me to climb out onto the roof of the moving car, which I did. And it, it took me a good 10 seconds before any of them knew that I was actually gone from the car, which was, which uh, in my defense, I will say that the, the car was not actually moving that fast, and there were no other cars on the road, and when I did this, I was pretty sure that nobody cared whether I lived or died. So, anyway. Uh, oh, thank you. It's, it's very, where, where were you in that? Um, so this is my frame of mind as the lab safety officer. Uh, while I'm there in the lab, one day, and I hear my fellow lab technician start to swear because she has just dropped one of our most precious tissue samples down into the bottom of a storage tank of liquid nitrogen. Word of explanation, liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen is the major component of the air all around us. It's what you take if you take air and you lower it down to a temperature of minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit minus 197 Celsius, it turns into a liquid. Um, you actually may see things like liquid nitrogen. It shows up a lot in like TV and movies because they're, they're always using it there very dramatically to like freeze flowers or killer robots from the future. And they like hit them with a hammer and they shatter into a million pieces. It's very, very dramatic. Um, there is not so much demand for that in biology laboratories. Um, but Actually, mostly biology laboratories use liquid nitrogen a lot, though, for the purpose of storing in really, really deep freeze samples that they want to preserve. For example, in a cell biology laboratory like ours, you would sometimes have some kinds of, of precious cells. You would put them into vials. You would stick them into a rack that you would then lower down into the liquid nitrogen, and they would then be frozen in suspended animation until such time as you decided you needed that cell sample and you pulled out the rack and you took back the sample and you warmed it up again and the cells were all alive again. And this is a great system. Unless, of course, you do what Lisa had just done, which was that you accidentally drop that sample out of the rack and it just drops to the bottom of the kind of, kind of barrel of liquid nitrogen that is a couple of feet deep. Because if you do that, the only way to get the sample 
is to dump out all of the liquid nitrogen and risk thawing all of the samples, which can be potentially catastrophic. And that was the problem that we were now faced with. So I decided to help out Lisa on this, and we tried to figure out what to do, because of course it's, you know, it's, it's this deep underneath a liquid that is minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know if I mentioned that it's that cold, but it's very, very cold. So uh, we first took a couple of like, like yardsticks, and we were trying to sort of chopstick out this little tiny vial. We're like reaching down, we're trying to grab that, and that did not work at all. Um, <laughs> And then we had the great idea, we, we went to the kitchen and we grabbed a fork and we took some rubber bands. We used the rubber bands to attach the fork to the end of the yardstick and we put the yardstick and the fork down into there and the rubber bands instantly shattered and the fork now fell to the bottom <laughs> of the container. And we just, we kept trying things and there was just nothing we could come up with and that's when the wave of irresponsibility came over me and I said to Lisa, well, I'm just going to reach in there and grab it. And I think Lisa did say, please don't do that. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I, I'm going to do it. Now, now, bear with me while I tell you why it is that I thought I could get away with this. And remember, I'm a trained safety officer. Here's the thing about liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen shows something that's called the Leidenfrost effect, which is that if you take, say, your hand, and you put your hand into the liquid nitrogen, that the warmth of your hand will warm up the liquid nitrogen, and a very thin layer of nitrogen vapor will form between your hand and the liquid, and that will serve as an insulator. And so you'll be, your hand will be exposed to the merely cold vapor rather than the unbelievably cold liquid. Unfortunately, when you do this, your hand is cooling down while it's in there, so that layer gets very, very thin, very, very fast, and you really have, at most, only a second or two before the liquid is in contact with your skin. But we would do this all the time in the lab. We would often just stick our fingers into the liquid nitrogen and cook a little, you know, little way. It was nothing, it was harmless. <laughs> Putting your arm all the way in is a different thing. But I was determined to do it. So, I was thinking ahead. I had a plan. I knew exactly what I was going to do. Step one, I started running some warm water because I knew when my hand came out I was going to need to warm up my arm a lot. So I had the warm water going. Step two, I went over and I found the biggest loose cotton uh, work glove that was in the lab and I put it on my hand and I shaped my hand into a claw because I knew as soon as I put my hand into the liquid nitrogen the claw would, the, the glove would freeze solid and I wouldn't be able to bend it anymore. I'm thinking ahead. <laughs> and with that, I walked over to the big container of liquid nitrogen, and I took a deep breath, and I plunged my arm in. Everything that I'm about to explain now happens in the space of two, three seconds at most. When you put your arm into a tank of liquid nitrogen, the first thing that happens is that a gigantic cloud of thick fog of nitrogen and water vapor immediately engulfs you. It's spouting out of there, boiling, furiously boiling off the top of this stuff. And now, every hope that I'd had of being able to look down through the nitrogen and see the sample is gone. Not that this would have mattered very much, because I've had to reach in so deep that I basically I had to turn my face sideways and I'm feeling little droplets of the nitrogen bouncing up onto my face and sizzling there. Meanwhile, inside the liquid nitrogen, my arm is not feeling good. It's not that my arm is cold because cold is a sensation that you leave behind somewhere way up at like minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
what you're experiencing now is, or what I was experiencing then, was a sensation. It was a sort of searing pain over every square inch of my arm that was like a combination of being burned and being numb. I could barely feel anything now through this, and I'm reaching down and I'm running into the real problem, which is that although I've reached in as far as I can, I can't quite seem to reach the bottom of the container. <laughs> I'm flailing around really quickly, and I feel the glove brush up against something, and so in a desperation play, I press the glove against the edge, and I rake it up the side and pull my arm back out as fast as I possibly can. And when I do, what flies out of the container and clatters to the ground is the fork. <laughs> I shake loose the glove off my hand. I plunge my hand back into the warm water, which I have standing by, because I'm thinking ahead. And I start checking, and you know, my fingers now hurt with the cold, but I can actually tell that I can actually, I have sensation in all of the fingers, and I take that to be a good sign. And, uh, and, and basically, everything is fine, except the one thing that I had forgotten to do was I didn't roll up my sleeve. Because I didn't roll up my sleeve, every fold and crease in the shirt sleeve froze to my skin. And as a result, for several weeks thereafter, I had a very interesting lattice of scars where every crease had been against the skin. Um, Lisa looks at the fork and me with my hand in the water and says, I, I don't suppose you want to do this again. And I said, no, I don't think so. And, and so at that point, we, we knuckled under her. We went to Dan and explained the situation. And Dan was great, because Dan was a mature adult. <laughs> Dan was very calm about the whole thing. He went over, he sized up the situation, he took all the nitrogen out of the tank, and then quickly we retrieved the sample that we needed, and then he just started putting nitrogen back into the tank. And yes, we wasted that much nitrogen, but it, in fact, because we did this all pretty quickly, none of the samples thawed out, no harm was actually done. And Dan said to me, you know, Johnny, yeah, the work's important, but it's, uh, it's, it's not worth uh, hurting yourself over. And I was so touched in that moment <laughs> to hear that kind of advice, that sort of, because it's, it's obvious. Yeah, I know it's obvious, but, it, but to hear that it was coming from someone like this, someone that I respected so much, and to hear that kind of forgiveness given in a spirit of nothing except just simple human compassion really touched me, knowing that he was driven that much by just, just sort of concern for me. Unless, of course, it was the early stages of the mercury poisoning. We may, we may never know. Thank you. That was John Rennie. John is an award-winning science writer, editor, and lecturer based in New York City. For 15 years, he served as editor-in-chief of Scientific American. Currently, he is the host of the Weather Channel's Hacking the Planet. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Bell House for hosting the show, and to Youth for making people willing to do things like that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>